All right, this morning I'm, I'm continuing a series that we started at the beginning of the year on moving forward. As we want to move forward in our faith, what God has called us to is we're, as we're moving in the direction that God is calling us to be. How do we get there? And what I wanted to do was use examples from the life of Jesus. So people that Jesus said, follow me to. We talked about Peter last, last week as Jesus said to him, follow me. Then we also have people that are moving in the direction of, of, of Jesus or, or people that Jesus is moving towards. So there's this idea of energy, of movement around that. This morning, I want to speak on something that you you may find is interesting. I've never, ever spoken on this person. I've never preached or taught on this person ever in my life. And it's someone that is pretty well known because of the uniqueness of the story, but you don't often get a lot of adult teaching on this. So this morning, I want to talk about Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus was a wee little man, and a wee little man was he. Everybody knows the song. It's great for kids' ministry. I'm not sure I've heard a lot of adult teachings on Zacchaeus. So uh, that's who I want to talk about. His story is found in Luke chapter 19, beginning with verse 1. This morning, I want to read the whole story, and then we're going to work back through a couple of specific verses that I want to look at and point out to you. So if you will, Luke chapter 19 and verse 1. This is the story of Zacchaeus. Then Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. Now behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus who was a chief tax collector, and he was rich. And he sought to see who Jesus was, but he could not because of the crowd, for he was of short stature. So he ran ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see Jesus, for he was going to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw Zacchaeus and said to him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must stay at your house. So he made haste and came down and received Jesus joyfully. But when they saw it, they all complained, saying, Jesus has gone to be a guest with a man who is a sinner. Then Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, I give half of my goods to the poor, and if I have taken anything from anyone by false accusation, I restore fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house because he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this time together. We ask that your Holy Spirit just continue to move in this place. We, we honor and praise you and we give the remainder of this service to you. Do anything you want here today. We offer it to you. In Jesus' wonderful name we pray. Amen. In the early 1960s, Frank Sinatra was at the, probably the apex, the pinnacle of his, of his fame and his career. For those of you that, were young, that are younger, he was a world-famous singer who became a world-famous actor who became just a world-famous person. And in the early 1960s, Frank Sinatra might have been the most famous person in the world. He was in movies. He was nominated for Academy Awards. I think he won an Academy Award. He was, a, he was a, one of the most popular singers of his day, one of the most popular performers. He piled around with a bunch of other guys. They were known as the Rat Pack. There was guys like Dean Martin and Sammy Davis Jr. in that. They made movies together. They made the original, original Ocean's Eleven. They made the original one, and they filmed it in Las Vegas. So they would perform at night in Las Vegas in the casinos and then film the movie during the day. He was the most famous person in the world. And he spent a huge amount of his time in Las Vegas because of he performed in casinos and all the rest of the things that he did. One night, he went out to a hotel casino that he occasionally visited, and he went to have dinner. He drove there, dropped his car off with the valet, went in and had dinner and came out, gave the valet, the kid, his ticket, and the guy brought his car around. Before Sinatra got in the car, he turned to the kid and he said, let me ask you something. What's the most money anybody ever gave you as a tip? What's the most money you ever got as a tip? The kid said, I got $50. Sinatra reached in his wallet, pulled out a $100 bill, gave it to the kid and said, there you go. He jumped in the car and before he drove off, he turned to him and he said, let me ask you something. What's the, who's the guy that gave you the $50? And the valet said, you did, Mr. Sinatra, the last time you were here. <laughs> Listen. <laughs> Listen. <laughs> Generosity is key to the Christian experience. Generosity is key to our life, to our maturity, to who we are, to who God is calling us to be. And like Frank Sinatra, our Christian walk should be a race to outgive ourselves. 
We're not in competition with anybody else. We're in a race to outgive ourselves, living lives of generosity. And no place else is the idea of generosity so amazingly illustrated than other, other than in the life of Zacchaeus. So I want to look back at this very quickly. Look at Luke 19 and 8. We just read it, but I want to read this verse again. And Zacchaeus stood and said to Jesus, Lord, I give half of my goods to the poor, and if I have taken anything from anyone by false accusation, I restore fourfold. Here's the first thing. Our generosity transforms others. Our generosity, your, your willingness to be generous can transform the lives of people around you. Now, I want to make it clear as I start, I am not only talking about financial generosity. I want to make that clear because so many, you get in church, you go, oh, preacher's talking about giving money. Preacher's talking about finances. That's an aspect of it, but that's not the only thing. I'm talking about being generous with everything that you do, generous with your time, generous with your energy, generous with your compliments, generous with your love, generous with your forgiveness, generous with your everything, lives of generosity. That's what God is calling us to live. Zacchaeus said, I'm giving half of my stuff away. If I've stolen anything, I'm giving four times back to them. I am giving and giving and giving and giving. I'm willing to be generous. And I promise you that generosity transformed the people that he was giving it to. The same is true of us. I have because we had all boys, and all of my boys were always interested in sports. Liam a little less so, but he, I've coached him in, I don't even know, different sports. I've coached just about every kind of youth sport you can possibly think of. Flag football, tackle football, basketball, baseball, soccer, which I know nothing about. And my team's won two soccer. I've been the most the most successful coach I've been is in soccer, of which I know nothing about, which proves how little the importance of a coach is. Everybody's like, that guy's a great coach. No, I'm not. Kick the ball in the net, boys. Let's go. That's the extent of my soccer coaching. So I've coached all of it. Years and years ago, when our middle son Owen was about seven, he played flag football in, uh, in Florida. We lived in Lakeland, Florida at the time. And uh, we coached a little flag football team, and I, I was coaching both the boys, Mark in one team, <laughs> Owen on the other, so we did practices back to back. So Courtney would come out, and then when it was over, she would take them all home. So I was hanging around as the last of the uh, kids were getting picked up, and I was about to leave, and I realized that there was one kid that was still there. Now, let me just tell you something, in youth coaching, the number one rule, you can't leave kids alone on the field and go home. Like the people in charge of the leagues, they get real, real upset about that if you just abandon children. So I was like, all right, well, this kid's still here, so I'm going to hang out. So I went over to him. We had played a couple of games. We'd done practice. So you know the kids, but you don't really know the kids. And they don't, you know, they're seven, eight years old playing flag football for some guy who's the dad of one of the other kids. So I, I told him, let's throw the football around and we'll wait for your parents to come pick you up. And as little kids do... They just tell you everything, anything, little kids. So we're throwing the football around, and I said, well, we'll just wait till your parents come pick you up. We're throwing the football. And he said, well, he said, my dad is not going to come and pick me up. And I said, oh, okay. I said, why isn't your dad, dad going to come pick you up? He said, I don't see my dad anymore. And I said, what do you mean? He said, my dad and my mom got divorced when I was little. He was seven, so I don't know what that meant. He said, my mom and dad got divorced when I was little. And he said, my dad has a new family. And my, he said, my dad doesn't come watch me play football anymore. And he said, actually, I don't ever see my dad anymore. That, that moment still kills me. That moment still kills me. So what do you do? So here's what I did. I said, well, he's missing out. Your dad's missing out because you're great 
Every time you touch the football, you're so fast, you can catch it, you score touchdowns. I think you're great. I think what you're doing at football is great. You're fantastic, and he's missing out because you're a great kid, and I'm proud of you, and I'm proud of how good you are at football, and I'm proud of everything you do, and I just started pouring it on him, pouring it on him. Because listen to me, that is what I'm talking about. If you think what I'm talking about is putting money in the offering, you're missing what I'm saying. Our generosity has the ability to radically transform the people around us. The whole world, the whole world in pain, the whole world suffering, the whole world waiting for somebody to say, I love you and I'm proud of you. I told that kid, I loved him. I said, Jesus loves you. I prayed with him when it was over. What are they going to do? Fire me? I got a real job. I'm not, I mean, so I prayed with him. I told him about Jesus. We, I, listen, I don't, I don't know where he is. We don't live in, that was, golly, that was 15 years ago, 13 years ago. We don't live in Florida anymore. I don't know where he is. What my only hope is, that on the days that they got really bleak, on the really dark days that that kid said, I remember my little chubby uh, flag football coach that told me he was proud of me. I don't have a lot of good stuff going for me, but I can pour into the lives of other people. We can be generous. This is what this is about. Now, let me tell you one for me, somebody that transformed me. Me and Courtney got married. We were kids. Kids. We got married young, we started having babies young, and we were broke, broke, broke. <laughs> when we got married, I made $12,000 a year, and we got married, and then decided to have a baby. On to, I remember, I got a raise to $18,000 a year, I came home and I was like, baby, what are we going to do with all this money? I was like, I'm just going to work a couple more years and retire $18,000 a year. I don't even know what we're going to do with $18,000 a year. We were broke. We were always broke. My dad and mom had a couple that they had been friends with for my entire life. They had kids our age. We used to go and spend the night at their house. We'd stay with them when my parents would go on mission trips or when they were gone. They're my parents' age. Every time I would see him, now I want to make it clear, we didn't live in the same town. I'd see him at Christmas or a special occasion, they'd come to visit my folks, so I'd see him maybe two or three times a year. Every time I saw him for a decade, from the time I was about 21 or 22 when we got married till I was in my early 30s, for about a decade of my life, every time I would see him, he would hug my neck, he would tell me he loved me, tell me how proud he was of me, what a good job I was doing, how great my kids were. And then at the very end, whenever he was leaving or whatever, he would shake my hand. And when he shook my hand, he would palm me a $100 bill every single time. There were times when I was like, Courtney, we got to see him soon because we don't have any money. <laughs> I was like, we got to... We got to make a trip to his house. What we'll spend on gas, we're going to come out ahead on this because I got to get that, I got to have that handshake, man. Listen, he poured into my life, told me he was proud of me. He was generous with his time, with his compliments, and he was generous with us financially. He didn't have to do that every single time for a decade. He would give me that handshake and give me that $100 bill, which sometimes was a huge, huge thing for our little family and our boys and what we were trying to do. Our generosity transforms the lives of people around us. Everybody in the life of Zacchaeus said, look at that guy. What did we just read? He's a sinner. He's a bad guy. He's a terrible guy. I promise you, they weren't all saying that after he gave half his money away. Now, some people you can't help. You give them, no matter how much you give them, they're still going to say you're a sinner and a terrible guy. But a bunch of them, are going to be transformed because of your willingness to be generous and poor into their life. Our generosity transforms everybody else. But that's not the end of the story. It only gets better. Look back, if you will, at 19 and 6. What we just read. So Zacchaeus made haste and came down from the tree, came down from the tree and... What does it say? Received Jesus joyfully. He received Jesus joyfully, which tells us what? Our generosity transforms us. 
Our generosity transforms us. Zacchaeus received Jesus joyfully. And his his willingness to be generous, his willingness to give, transformed him himself. Our generosity transforms us. It transforms all the other people. And we think, oh, we can help these folks. We can help them. We can help them. But listen to me. The person your generosity helps the most is you. Your willingness to give transforms you more than anybody else. There's a great movie came out a number of years ago, one of my favorite movies. It is a Christmas movie, but it is a fantastic movie. It, it's, it's a retelling of a, a, a Christmas carol, but, uh, it's, uh, the, but the main character is a TV executive played by Bill Murray. It's called Scrooged. Scrooged is one of my favorite movies. It is a great movie, and it's about this guy who realizes what life is about. And there's a part at the end of the movie where he says, look, you can, you can change. I've changed, and you can change. He says, there are people out there that are cold. You can take them a blanket. He said, there's people out there that are hungry. You can take them a sandwich. You can say, here. And he said, you can give, and you can experience the same miracle I've experienced. And then he says, and then the more you do it, the more you want it. And he said, and you get greedy for it. That is us. We need to be greedy for the generosity to give ourselves away. The generosity transforms us. We're not greedy for the stuff. We're greedy for the ability to pour into the lives of others. Because as we give ourselves away, the person who is the most transformed is us. We find new levels of transformation. So what does that look like? Let me tell you about two people in two different churches that I previously was at. First church we were ever on staff at, I was the missions and outreach pastor at a, at a mega church in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Huge church, huge missions budget. And we did all kinds of stuff. We did mobile medical where we would go into low-income uh, uh, neighborhoods and provide a full medical thing. We had an RV fitted out. We worked with an organization, had an RV with doctors and nurses and medicine on it. We did all kinds of stuff. We did back-to-school events. We did Christmas events. We gave away bicycles. We did three, four mission trips a year. Huge stuff. So one year, we were starting a new thing called Global and Local. GL 2010. This was a decade ago we were doing this. Our global ministry, our global reach, and our local ministry, our local reach. Global, local, 2010. And the senior pastor was talking about all the stuff we were going to do. I was invited to come on the stage, talk about the things we were doing, how we were going to be able to help people, how we were going to be able to transform communities, how we were going to be able to give into the lives of others. After the service, an older lady cornered me in the hallway of the church. She said, you're the missions pastor, right? I said, yes, I am. And because I was fresh and new in the ministry, I thought she was going to tell me what a great job I was doing. <laughs> and boy, was I wrong. She said, you're the missions pastor, aren't you? I said, yes, I am. How can I help you? She said, listen to me. She said, this is my name. And she told me your name. And she said... I don't want one penny of the money I give to the church to go towards helping anybody. She told me that. She said, this is my tithe and it goes for the church. I don't want any of it to go overseas. I don't want any of it to go to this global local thing you're doing. I don't want it to help. I want it for the church. I was like, whew, you're a wonderful lady. I've really enjoyed this time together. It strengthened me in my faith. I don't want any of the money that I give to go to helping anybody. What? Listen to me. She was probably not receiving Jesus joyfully. Put verse 6 back up for me, if you will. And he made haste and came down and received Jesus joyfully. I bet if Jesus showed up at that old lady's house, she'd say, I don't want any of my money going to help this guy. <laughs> Let me tell you another story about the last church I pastored in Tekoa. A guy there named Bob, and Bob was one of the greatest Christians I've ever known in my life. Loving, generous, joyful. He was a retired businessman. He had owned, if you can believe this, he had owned a company that manufactured the control boxes for elevators. So if you've ever gotten on an elevator and pushed the button, that guy's company probably made that control panel. 
And he sold that business and was retired, attended my church, and he was joyful and loving and giving. One, one day, one week, the first year I was there, after Thanksgiving, he came into my office one day during the week. He said, Preacher, I've got a check for you. I said, okay, great, Bob, that's wonderful. He said, but here's what I want. He said, I want you to use this money to help people. I said, okay, Bob, what do you mean? And he laughed and laughed, and he said, what do you mean, preacher? He said, help people with it. <laughs> and he put it on my desk, and he walked out. And I was like, but I don't, Bob, what am I, I, right? And he said, just help people. And he laughed and walked out. And you know what we did? We started a thing at that church with the money that Bob gave called the Christmas blessing. And we gave money to people in our church that needed help. And then we took up an offering from everybody the next year. And then because it was such a wonderful thing, every year I've been here, we take up a Christmas blessing offering. And in 2019, we gave away more than $5,000 to people in our church that needed help. And you know where it came from? It came from Bob in Tacoa that wrote me a check and said, help people. Now you say to yourself, well, it's easy. It's easy for him to be joyful and happy all the time. He's a successful retired businessman. He sold his company for a bunch of money, which he did. He lives in a nice house, which he did. So it's easy for Bob to be joyful and happy. Except I didn't tell you the whole story. Bob had worked his entire life, worked hard, built a company, and he decided to sell it and retire. And him and his wife were going to travel the world, see all the stuff that they had missed in their 30s and their 40s and their 50s while he was working. He sold his company. He made a lot of money from that successful sale of his company. Elevator, control panels, wouldn't think that would be, but he sold it, and they were ready to travel. Months after he sold his company, his wife was diagnosed with advanced early onset dementia. And Bob and his wife never took a single trip anywhere. I got there just about less than two years after he had sold that company. And they came to church, and they stayed in their house, and Bob fed his wife, took care of her, do all the stuff you got to do for people with dementia. And they never saw Italy. And they didn't go to Paris. And Bob was the happiest, most joyful, most loving person I've ever known in my entire life, probably. You want to know why? Because his generosity had transformed him. His generosity had transformed him. What happens is we decide, we decide that our levels of joy are equal to our levels of satisfaction in life. Oh, if this is going good, then I can be happy. But listen, by being generous, by giving away, then the circumstances of life can change. They can be up, they can be down, it can be great, it can be terrible. It doesn't matter because our willingness to give to others, to pour into the lives of others, it transforms us. It transforms us. The difference between that woman and my friend Bob is radically different. And the difference is this. Bob was willing to pour into the lives of others. How many times have I said this here in the last five years? So those of you who've been here for a while have heard this example, but it's 100% true. If you are totally and completely full all the time, how can God possibly pour more blessings and miracles into your life? See, what happens is we get those blessings and miracles and we hold on to them, right? We gather them all. They're all mine. They're all mine. And then somebody comes and needs some help. Rico comes and he needs some help. Yeah, get away. Get away. Crazy Puerto Rican. Get away. <laughs> None for you. Right? We don't have any. No room. No, 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 no. Right? We hold on. And then Gene comes and Gene needs something. Get away, Gene. Gene's just crazy. Crazy. Yeah. <laughs> Not crazy Puerto Rican, just crazy American. Get away. No. None for Gene. Right? None for Gene. Uh, Dave, no. 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 As opposed to what? I pour into Rico's life. I pour into Gene's life. I pour into the lives of all the others. And what happens? God pours more into mine. You cannot give it away. You pour and you pour and you pour. And God just pours more in. You say, why hasn't God blessed me? Maybe 
it's because there's no room for the blessing. Maybe why hasn't God poured into my life? Why hasn't God given me this thing I've been praying for? Maybe it's because you've got to give some of what you've got away so that there's room for more of it to come in. Our generosity transforms us. Generous with every aspect of our life, as I have said. Generous with everything. Everything we do. Everything we're about. Generosity. Now here's the final thing. Look back at Luke 19. Verse 9. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house because he is also a son of Abraham. But look at the beginning. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house. When did salvation come to the house? When Zacchaeus was generous. When he gave it away. When he was willing to say, I restore to the people that I I robbed, I restore it fourfold. To everybody else, I'm giving away half my stuff. I'm giving it away. And then what happens? Salvation has come to this house, which tells us what? Our generosity transforms our relationship with Jesus. Our generosity transforms our relationship with Jesus. So what happens? We say, I don't feel close to Jesus. I don't feel close to God. I feel like my prayers aren't getting answered. I feel like I have trouble talking. I feel like I have trouble praying. Let me suggest something to you. Start being generous and see how transformational your relationship becomes. Be generous. What is, I want you to look at, some, at the book of James. Aaron said uh, James, uh, Romans was his favorite book. Those of you who've been here for a while know, James is my favorite book of the Bible. I love the book of James. Look at James chapter 2, beginning with verse 14. What does it profit, my brethren, if when someone says he has faith but does not have works, can faith save him? What does it profit? 15. If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? Thus also, faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead." That's exactly what we're talking about. Somebody comes and says, I'm hungry, I'm destitute, I don't have anything. And we say, well... I'll be praying for you. Good luck with all of that. Faith without works is dead. Our generosity transforms our relationship with Jesus. You say, I don't feel close to Jesus. I can't hear from Jesus. I can't tell what he's saying to me. Maybe it's because all the moments where you could have heard from him were part of your generosity and working and giving into the lives of others. Somebody comes and says, I need help. And you say, good luck with that. I'll be praying for you and do nothing. Faith without works is dead. But it can be different. Look at verse 22. James 2 and 22. Do you see that faith working together with his works and by works, faith was made perfect. You want to be perfect? Be generous. The more generous you are, the closer to perfection you get, and the closer to Jesus you get. Now, I know most of y'all, so I'm just going to tell you right now, you're not going to be perfect. Some of y'all are a long way from perfect. Long way. Long way from perfect. But listen, perfect is the goal though, Right? Perfect is the goal, and we don't get any closer to the goal without generosity. Faith, faith, faith without works. And it is interesting that the works that he describes is generosity. James could have used any work. The work that he describes is generosity, a brother and a sister who needs help. Faith without generosity is dead. But faith with generosity is perfect. That is what we want. I want you to see this. There is another place. Look, if you will, at Luke chapter 18. Go back one chapter from where we started. Luke chapter 18, beginning with verse 18. Luke 18 and 18. 
Now a certain ruler asked Jesus, saying, Good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but one, and that is God. Then he says, You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Honor your father and your mother. And the young ruler said, All these things I have kept from my youth. So when Jesus heard these things, he said to him, You still lack one thing. Sell all that you have and distribute to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come, follow me. What does he say? Let's boil down verse 22. And Jesus said, you still lack one thing. Be generous. Be generous and come and follow me. 23. And when he heard this, he became very sorrowful, for he was very rich. That is not an indictment of wealthy people. It is an indictment of a heart that is stingy. Yes, amen. Zacharias was very rich. We just read that in Luke 19. And yet he was willing to give and give and give. It's not saying rich people are bad or wealthy people are, are bad or anything else. It is talking about levels of generosity. The same story is told in Mark chapter 10. And it says the young ruler went away sad. Jesus says, follow me. But to follow me, you must be generous. And Zacharias said, that's what I want. And he followed Jesus, and he gave it away. And Jesus said, salvation has come to this house. And then the rich young ruler says, I want to be with you. And Jesus says, follow me, and follow me by being generous. And the rich young ruler said, I'm going this way. Zacharias was joyful, was joyful. And his relationship with Jesus was transformed. The rich young ruler was sad, and his relationship with Jesus was nothing. He left. He said, I would rather hold on to all my blessings than have the opportunity to follow Jesus. Generosity transforms others, transforms us, and transforms our relationship with Jesus. So let me close with this. Let me give you two things that are really cool. I always like it when I plan my sermons out months and months and months in advance. I plan out the series. I plan out the individual sermons. I know everything I'm preaching between now and August. So it's always very, very encouraging to me when Jesus reminds me that what I'm doing on any particular Sunday is the right thing. This week, you guys remember in the fall, we collected Christmas boxes for the school in West Africa, for Global Servant School that we run in Ghana. Me and the team were there last year. We collected those boxes. We put them in larger boxes. We put them on a container. We shipped that container to West Africa. You've probably forgotten about it. This past week, that container finally made, and those boxes made their way to the school in West Africa. And they got their Christmas boxes a few weeks late. But they got their Christmas boxes. This is a picture of all the boxes. There's little boxes inside all those big boxes. In case you want to know, it costs about $800 to ship that many boxes to West Africa. <laughs> That's what it costs to put it on the, uh, on the uh, container. So go to the next one for me. Now there's some of them holding their individual Christmas boxes that you did that you bought the stuff, you packed those boxes, you put them together, you paid for that. This is your generosity. Now show some of those, open them in the classrooms. Go to the next one. Uh, wait, look at that little guy in the, in the yellow right there. Look how happy he is. Go to the next one. Give me the final one. Look at those smiles. Listen to me. Your generosity transforms them. Your generosity transforms you. And your generosity gets you closer to Jesus. That is how it works. This is what it's about. Let me tell you a final story. I have a friend of mine named Ronnie Brandon. He, for years and years, was... Um, the chairman of the board for Global Servants, and he has recently resigned from that and resigned from the church he was pastoring, and he actually works for me at, at uh, Global Servants now. He, for years and years and years, had sponsored a girl in Thailand. 
for years, as Courtney and I did. You've heard me share about my girl. We sponsored her. She's graduated now. She's got a job and, a, and, and an apartment, and it's amazing what that did for us. He sponsored this girl for years and years and years, but was never able to visit Thailand. Finally, he was able to make his first trip to Thailand. By then, the girl that he had sponsored had graduated from high school, gone off, gotten married, had kids of her own. She had a job. She had a wonderful family and a life. When she heard that Ronnie was coming back, to, was coming, not back, coming to the House of Grace for the first time to visit, she made her way to House of Grace. She took a bus. Then she sat on the back of a motorcycle. She traveled for hours and hours and hours back to House of Grace to see Ronnie, her sponsor. When she got there, she ran up to Ronnie and she hugged him. She said, you made my life possible. You made my life possible. Listen to me. How did he make it possible? Generosity. He didn't invent some thing. Some, he didn't do any generosity. The simple act of sponsoring her every month, month after month, year after year. God's call to all of us, myself included, you can make someone's life possible. This is what I want you to do in the week ahead, the weeks ahead, the months ahead in 2020. I want you to find ways to be generous. You go, I don't know how to serve. You may say to me, I don't have any money. I can't just be giving people $100 handshakes. Hey, don't do that for anybody else but me, by the way. That's mine. <laughs> I can't be giving people, listen to me. You want to know how you can be generous? Go to any assisted living facility anywhere in this area. Walk in and say, I just want to help people. They won't even bat an eye. You sign something and you can just go from room to room and love on them and tell them how glad you are and sit with them and listen to their stories. Half of them think you're their grandkids anyway. It's true. I've been in, I've been in dozens and dozens of assisted living facilities. They just want somebody to visit them. They just want somebody to talk to them. They just want somebody to hang out with them. You play the piano? You say, well, I'm not good enough to play on the stage. Look how good Davis is. Look how good the Parms are. I'm not as good as them. You play the piano, go to an assisted living facility, sit in the rec room and play the piano for them. That's how we give. You want to do something? Go work in prisons. We got a bunch of guys that go and do prison ministry. Go and do prison ministry. Jesus told his disciples, when I was hungry and you fed me, when I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink, when I was naked and you clothed me, when I was in prison and you comforted me. And they said, God, Jesus, Lord, when did we do that? He says, when you do it to the least of them, you do it to me. Generosity. Generosity. Go to a restaurant. Think of what the biggest tip you could possibly leave is. What can I afford? What can I live with myself for with? Give them the biggest tip possible. Add $10 to the biggest number you could think of and write on the receipt, I love you and Jesus loves you. Do that. Give. Tell everybody in your life you're proud of them. Tell everybody in your life you're proud of them. Tell everybody in your life you believe in them. Tell everybody in your life you love them. The people that are around us need that affirmation. Give and give and give and give, and give. And you know what? God will just keep pouring it in. And we give and give, and He just keeps pouring it in. And the generosity transforms them, and transforms us, and transforms our relationship with Him. I want to be perfect. I'm never going to be perfect, but the only way I get closer to it is through generosity. Be generous. Let's pray. Lord, I ask every person, I, I pray for every person here, you would show each of us, myself included, you would show every single person here opportunities and ways that we can be more generous. Generous with our time, generous with our compliments, generous with our love, generous with our encouragement, generous with our forgiveness. God, generous with our finances, generous with everything that we do. Help us, God, to live lives of generosity. I want it, God. I want that. Show me. And God, I ask that you show every person here ways that they can love others. We praise you, we worship you, and we glorify you. Help us all to be more generous in every way possible. 
In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen and amen.